What's up, buggers? This is the second episode in a running series where I cover the entire Genshin Impact timeline as seen on the wiki page and more, so you can have a better understanding of this game's really dense and confusing lore. So if you like this episode or you need context for the stuff I cover in this episode, then go check out the other episodes in the playlist uh, in the top right of the screen. All right, so now that that's out of the way, let's just get into it. This episode is going to be the first in a series of a few where I cover each region's activities during the Archon War. The Archon War is a catch-all term for the various conflicts that took place after, according to Sumero scholar Suraya, seven seats opened in Celestia. Before the events of the war, and as I briefly mentioned during the previous episode, Andreas got a little pissed with humanity and imparted an eternal blizzard into Mondstadt. To protect from this, the god of storms Decarabian, who had a particular disdain for Andreas, hauled up in what he called Mondstadt, also known as the Moon City. What, what, what the fuck is up with moons in this game, man? Dude. <laughs> he used his powers to create a wall of storms that kept everything outside out and everything inside in. That included people. Now this is something I never actually realized. Dick Arabian did this for a few reasons. What's often said is he closed off Mondstadt as a way to keep those he ruled in for nefarious reasons. But that's not true at all. According to biography of Gunhilda, Decarabian enclosed Mondstadt in order to protect his people who he cared for and wanted to keep alive, and ignored the looming threat of Andreas. Okay, future whale editing this video here. So I was double checking my citations for this part of the video, and I realized that nowhere in biography of Gunhilda does it say anything along the lines of Decarabian mist mistook the worship of the people as genuine worship. It does say that Gunhilda's father, the then leader of the clan, um, served until he found the despotic rule and the aloof of of the aloof selfish king to be more than he could bear. So that it assumes that Decarabian's a bit of a dunce. In Debris of Decarabian City, it says that Decarabian was content with the capital city he had raised and accepted the worship of the people from atop his tower, but he knew not that the people did not bow to him out of respect or adoration. So this does kind of prove what I was saying about how Decarabian mistook genuine or mistook the fearful worship of the people that he was unintentionally scaring into submission as genuine worship, but it doesn't say in the way in the places that I thought it did. I have no clue where I got that citation. If somebody can find it and uh, fix it for me, that would be great. But that is, I think, where the proper citations are. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So yeah, uh, back to the video. This ignorance, mixed with the claustrophobia the people of Mondstadt started to develop, formed a fear of Decarabian. The people of Old Mondstadt started worshipping him simply out of fear, and Decarabian, being the dunce he was, mistook it for genuine worship. He could not have been any more wrong. <laughs> During this time, a group of aristocrats living in Old Mondstadt, and remember that this time was plagued by the aristocracy, just not the extent of early modern Mondstadt, a group from the Gunhelda clan found a way to leave Old Mondstadt somehow. They did this because the leader of the clan found Decarabian's tyrannical rule, quote, aloof and selfish, to a degree that he could not continue to watch. It isn't clear how exactly the head of the house found and led his family out, but they found their way out one way or another. However, they quickly learned why Decarabian had been so adamant on keeping his people in and the winds out. The family struggled to survive in the harsh perpetual winter winds. Some of them nearly died in the conditions until their pleas, which turned so desperate that they became worshipped, the wind manifested a wind spirit. Now there are a few things I feel like I need to point out here. The first of which is that yes, this is the second family that found a way out of Decorabian's rule. The other family was the Vindignir family, who went to found Sal Vindignir. The second is the identity of the wind spirit. Wind spirits are a strange thing, and the only one we've actually heard of that's been identified is the early form of Venti, this little bitch we see in the story cutscene. So there's a possibility that this wind spirit described here is the same as the one Venti describes to us, but as far as we know, wind spirits could have been all over the place. We have no way of knowing. But either way, this wind spirit gave the Gunhilda clan shelter and a chance to survive, as well as giving the father's daughter, Gunhilda, the quote, power to protect. Vague, but I guess it works. Soon after, the chief of the clan passed, and Gunhilda took over the head of the clan. Now comes the fun part, the uprising against Decarabian. See, people became so fed up with Decarabian's tyrannical rule that they decided that something had to be done. Whether people figured out if Decarabian was being tyrannical or just being an idiot is unclear, but it doesn't matter. 
Talks of a resistance started anyways, with the term Windbloom being used as a code word to refer to this insurgence. Soon, three people rose to become the most influential figures in this resistance. The Nameless Bard teamed up with the Wind Spirit Barbados, the Red-Haired Warrior of Mysterious Identity, and Amos, Decorabian's former lover. These three and a half insurgency members f <laughs> Fuck, <laughs> I forgot I wrote that. <laughs> These three and a half insurgency members led the fight against the Caribbean, along with other names including Gunhilda herself. They end up in victory, but not without a cost. Both the Nameless Bard and Amos fall in battle. Because of this, when Venti rose to take the position of the Anima Archon, he took the likeness of the Bard and adopted the bow as his weapon of choice to honor the Nameless Bard and Amos. What's left now is just simply the fall of the war. That red-haired warrior for some reason refuses to worship or even respect Barbados. Not much comes of this except for the minor punishment of his name, and only his name being lost to the wind. However, he left a family to carry his legacy, the Ragvinda clan, which you might know as Deluxe family. With this newfound power and unchallenged authority, Barbados reshapes the landscape of Mostak, creating the jagged mountains, cliffs, and valleys we're familiar with. He also created Pylos Peak, but that is kind of unimportant because that eventually just gets yeeted into the sea anyways at some point. And while he's at it yeeting pieces of Mostat landscape into the sea, he throws some mountains deeper into the sea and creates the Har Islands, also known by Klee as the Golden Apple Archipelago. He also uses the remains of old Mostat, which was wrecked in the war, to start the creation of new Mostat, where he would impart his ideals of freedom onto the people. In the city, a few families rise to power. The Iman Lauk clan, from that guy that found everybody dead in Vindignir, Gunhilda, and the Lawrence, started by Venerare, who is unimportant to the main timeline, so we will pretend that she does not exist. Now, with the new Mostat, Venti and the God of Time are said to have jointly ruled over Mostat, and were both worshipped, as their domains as gods, wind, and time were very tightly related. But as Barbados started realizing that the people had the will to live on their own without the help of a god, he left his people to their own vices, leaving Mostat and creating the city of freedom we know today. After Barbados dipped, the Windbloom Festival is created as a way to honor those that died, liberating Mostat from Decorabian acting as a furthering of that propaganda that Decorabian bad. However, the meaning of the festival soon shifted, and now it's the love-based festival we all know and love, and uh, love is debatable. Fittingly, a war kicked off the Archon War in Liyue. The battle took place in the Gwili Plains, causing it to no longer be the prosperous and beautiful plains, and instead made it into what we now know as Dihua Marsh. During this battle as well, Guizhong was slain, which made a lot of people sad. 3,700 years before the present, some time after the fall of the Guili Assembly, Morax relocates his people from Dihua Marsh to the south of Mount Tianhong, where he established Liyue Harbor. In order to protect this place better than he did with Dihua Marsh, he contracts with the Adepti to defend the harbor. During this time, the Qixing was established as the leaders of the harbor. The Qixing go on to establish the Milith Brigade and protect the people against minor threats, such as Hillaturals and the like. The Adepti were always around to protect against the greater threats, though. Morax eventually establishes the use of Mora as a currency after creating a model home out of the material. Quickly, Mora became the global language, the currency that everybody treated in. However, these peaceful endeavors never got Liyue anywhere, and so Morax decided to wage war against the other gods as he saw it as the only way to protect his people and allow them to develop further. Now, unlike Mondstadt's Archon War, the stories of Liyue's Archon War are less a single cohesive story and more similar to a vague collection of stories that all take place sometime between the founding of the harbor and the end of the Archon War. First, during a battle of no specific name, the god of that episode slashes Mount Tianhong, creating a crack in the foundation of the mountain, causing it to slowly start collapsing into the village below. To prevent this, Skybracer, one of the many adeptus that swore to protect the city, had one of his friends cut off his antlers and use them to prop the mountain up. What's special about these antlers is that they were given to Skybracer as a gift from Morax, meaning that these antlers were made up of the pure divine essence of Morax, making them one of the hardest materials known to Liyue. As such, the antlers were capable of holding a mountain. Skybracer, after achieving this monumental task, continued to fight despite the extreme amount of blood loss he was experiencing. Eventually, he bled to death, with his blood turning the Bishui River. River. Somewhere else, and by somewhere I mean South Terre, Havria, the god of salt, is just kicking it and doing her own thing. She's a gentle soul whose nature made her quite shitty at protecting her people, and so her strategy in a war amongst gods is to never give anybody a reason to wage war against her. And while that might be a good strategy in high school, that is not a good strategy in a divine scale game of Fortnite. Eventually, the war- <laughs> Fuck me, I hate these lines. <laughs> Eventually, the wars took her once rather vast territories and courted her into Salt Rey, where she created a city with her followers. 
However, they were doubtful of the deity's ability to keep them safe and decided that it would just be easier to end her here and now instead of having to watch her constantly fear the looming threat of the Archon War growing steadily near. So they assassinate her. But even though she easily was the weakest of the gods, she still had an innate power within her and the act of killing her released that energy, solidifying the entirety of the city and those within it. Okay, actually going back to the god we care about, we're actually just kicking unending amounts of ass with his epic spear skills. He defeats multiple gods and sea monsters, including Osile, by eating massive spears he shaped out of stone and pinning them to the ocean floor. Apparently, this is something I didn't know, the stone formation created out of the ceiling of these monsters takes the shape of his own geo symbol. Around 2,600 years ago, the dragon Chi, which used to be pronounced Chingsa, made its nest in modern-day Mount Chingsa and rules over the region. Morax fought the thing and eventually won. After the thing died though, it turned into stone, its blood became water, and its scales turned into terrace fields. Chi's power still infests the land, however, being the cause of the orange stones in Beach Street Plains, among other things. To suppress this poisoning, Morax sealed Chi's remains in five different places with geo seals to prevent its revival and mute its influences on the world. Somewhere around here, Wulong Hill dies because of a whale-tailed monster leading the youth to their death. That is the weirdest and shortest side note so far in this entire timeline. So because Morax has been kicking abhorrent amounts of ass in this war, he basically had corpse among corpse of dead gods strewn about his domain. Eventually, Mother Nature starts to take care of it, decomposing their bodies and returning them to the Earth. But Mother Nature can only do so much. The energies of those deities still held a grudge against Morax and refused to let go. And this energy that lingered, filled with hate and resentment, created miasmas, curses, and monsters. To combat this, in classic Morax style, he summoned other beings to do the cleaning for them. He summoned the Yakshas. How many he summoned is actually unclear, however we do know that there were five that stood out as the strongest. Bosatius, Indarius, Bonanus, that just looks like banana, uh, Minogius and Aladdis, who eventually became known as Xiao. And at this point, we all know the story of, the, of these boys, right? Three of them die, one disappears, and Xiao becomes the only known Yaksha left. Finally, the last thing to cover is the unknown doctor who dedicated themselves to curing the karmic disease left by the corpses of the gods the Yakshas had slain. Leaving these bodies allowed a negative karmic energy to seep into Liyue, creating a pestilence that needed to be eradicated. This doctor used the right of Homa to prevent the further spread of the disease by cremating corpses, which eventually caused the epidemic to end. These people that took part in cremating founded what is now known to us as Wangsheng Funeral Parlor. Currently, the parlor is in its 77th generation of business with Hutao. By this time, all of the competition had been eradicated, allowing Morax to rise and become the sole Geo Archon of Teyvat, giving him unchallenged authority over Liyue, and allowing him to restore peace and order to his harbor and beyond, which he had always sought from the beginning. 